Hello, I'm Liz Thompson, Associate Editor at Immunity, um, and I'm at the 78th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the topic of the meeting is immunity and tolerance. And today, this afternoon, I'm talking to Lalitha Ramakrishnan, who'll be telling us from the University of Washington in Seattle, and she'll be telling us about her work on TB pathogenesis. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so TB is a, a problem that poses a major threat in many parts of the world. Um, but not all individuals who come into contact with the bacteria develop active disease. Um, and typically it's been thought that um, disease progression associates with um, failed immunity. But you've shown that um, an overactive immune response can actually um, lead to sp the spread of the bacteria. Um, and you've worked on, you've used zebrafish as a model system um, to look at TB pathology. So can you tell me a bit about why zebrafish makes such a good model for studying TB? Yeah, so um, t TB is, has, studying TB has been problematic, although the field has come a long way. But um, when, but, but it, the, 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 the bacterium that causes the human TB grows very slowly. And as you can imagine, because it's spread by aerosol, it's a B, what they call a biosafety level three pathogen. And so of course you can work in it, but it, res it can restrict the kinds of experiments that you can do. And when I, was a, when I joined Stan Falco's lab as a postdoc, his mantra has always been that he takes a, a, a surrogate host pathogen pair and then looks to model the, real, the, the disease in its, in its natural host. In other words, rather than modeling TB, the human TB bacterium in surrogate hosts like rabbits and guinea pigs and particularly mice, which is what people have done, the idea would be to take a related pathogen and study it in a, in a host that it actually causes disease in. Yep. And so this is how we came up with the idea to use Mycobacterium marinum. And at the time, we knew that it was fairly closely related to TB based on, um, actually initially on some cot curve hybridization analyses, which they used to do, and then on, uh, on RDNA um, uh, sequence analysis, 16S sequence analysis. And, um, but, but, and, and, and so we got to, and it, and it looked really good from the point of view of pathogenesis because it, it gave disease to fish and frogs. And when you looked at the disease, at the pathology, it looked exactly like human TB. And that was what was so appealing to me. I mean, I'm a physician and I, I'm, I'm very interested to see, um, to, 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 to look at disease correlates and so I you know I wanted to work backwards from that and I was quite pleased when I started to see this so that's how we got into uh, looking at mycobacterium marinum first and then we got into we got the idea I actually got it from one of my infectious diseases attendings at UCSF to study the zebrafish as yeah. a genetically tractable natural host so now we now we had a host pathogen pair where both were genetically tractable and on top of that, uh, the zebrafish is see-through yep. for the first weeks of its life. And that's the, it's that particular combination that has allowed us to make these discoveries, which I don't think we could have made in, uh, in, a, in a more uh, traditional model, because it was the ability to see the exact step of disease that was changed with various host and bacterial mutations that allowed us to understand what was going on and to come up with surprising discoveries that countered, you know, 60 or 70 years of dogma about the disease. Yeah, so, um, so one of those discoveries is um, the identification of balance of pro-inflammatory yes. and inflammatory yes. signals are important. Yeah. Um, so how did, how did you come across so that? Th th this is how we did it. So in a nutshell, we conduct, after we had established the model, um, a postdoc, a, a postdoc joined the lab, David Tobin, who's now a professor at Duke, and he had decided he had an interest in doing what a forward genetic screen. So essentially, we um, we piggybacked on a genetic screen that Cecilia Moans was doing for um, for uh, for some, for something else. She was looking at facial motor neuron migration, and. Um, she and so we we took her mutants and we simply asked are there mutants that are more susceptible and more resistant to disease and we came up with mutants in 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 
in, in both categories. And so we, when, we, when David followed up a susceptibility mutant, it mapped to an enzyme that was, um, that, that, that uh, is the last step, that catalyzes the last step in the synthesis of a pro-inflammatory uh, lipid, an eicosanoid, uh, and it's called leukotriene B4 or LTB4. So that was very nice because he could show that if you didn't make this inflammatory molecule, you were resistant, you were susceptible to TB. So that doesn't get us yet to the high inflammatory state. Yeah. We're only telling you that it's good, you need inflammation. How we got to the high infl inflammatory state is like th is this. We had these results in the fish and we obviously, and, and David had worked out the biology, or the detailed biology of how the absence of this molecule, of this uh, cause, in that in the absence of this molecule, the substrate gets channeled to an anti-inflammatory eicosanoid called a lipoxin, and that then acts as a sort of dominant immunoregulator. So it's essentially an innate immunoregulator, and, yeah. and, and that's how it was causing susceptibility. So this was all very nice. But the trouble began when we went to human cohorts. We decided that we, we should go and um, um, ascertain if this was true in a human cohort. So we, we had access to human TB patients in Vietnam. And when we, uh, at, when we looked at the alleles, when we looked at the, at, uh, at we, f we found variants in the leukotriene A4 hydrolase gene. And at the time we only had um, intronic variants. But what? But the pattern of and and they correlated with susceptibility. They were associated with susceptibility, so that was good. But the problem was that it was the heterozygotes who were protected, and both homozygotes were equally susceptible to disease. And so this became a problem. Became a pr it was a problem for us. It was a problem for our reviewers, our, our editors. And so we actually went to a leprosy cohort in um, in Nepal. And as you know, leprosy is also a disease, a mycobacterial disease that's quite important and has you know similar correlates like TNF for both protection and they think for patho pathology as well. So when we looked at leprosy, the same we saw the same thing. And so this is when we realized that. Uh, that high inflammation played a role as much as low inflammation, or that became our hypothesis. We then went back to the fish and recreated the high inflammatory state, which, which is another example of the power of the fish, because we could just put in, X, we could put in RNA for LTA4H. And lo and behold, we found that it was just as susceptible as the, as the, as the initial mutant. Yep. And it looked the same at the end point, but then when we worked backwards, we realized that the, the, the pathway to susceptibility was completely different. And um, I'll, I'll just quickly summarize it for you. If you have high LTA4H, you make too much TNF, and that engages the, um, the, s the series of kinases that have been implicated in program necrosis. They're called RIP1 and RIP3. And this then induces through a series of proteins it induces the mitochondrion to make excess of reactive oxygen species. And these actually are good because they kill the ba bacteria. Yeah. But then and they simultaneously. Yes. When you have too little t TNF, you also see um, genesis. You know, I, uh, that's actually getting complicated. Okay. I'll, I'll get to that in okay. a minute. But, uh, I but if you have too much reactive oxygen, you kill the bacteria. When I say too much, I mean an, you know an excess. The whatever the it's it's a deviation from normal, and uh, but then you kill the cell. And what we did, and this was a postdoc in my lab called Francisco Francisco Roca. He figured out that it was killing the cell essentially by two mechanisms. It was uh, the reactive oxygen was causing the translocation of a matrix mitochondrial protein. Uh, to to the to the mitochondrial membrane where it was participating in the formation of a of a pore of the mitochondrial pore and so that was one meth method of killing the cell and the other was that the reactive oxygen species were also activating uh, acid sphingomyelinase and in the lysosome and this was then overproducing ceramide which was killing the cell and so we've now found that if you block these downstream pathways you can protect the cell you can protect the cell from being killed uh, but at the same time the reactive oxygen 
species will kill the bacteria. Okay. So you can convert this hyper susceptible state to hyper resistant uh, by using these drugs. So you can convert a bad genotype into an ultra good genotype. Um, so, um, so given that you have these pro-inflammatory genotype, genotype, and then um, there's also um, anti um, lack of inflammatory mm. molecules is also thought to um, yes. progress disease. Do you think there's a case for personalized medicine? Yes, yes, that's uh, that's where we're, we are. We, we would like to go with this, you know. So we, as I said, have already come up with drugs for the high inflammatory state. Both of them happen to be orally available drugs, and it it it's now uh, it, now the next step would be to take these to to human trials. Yeah. Um, it would. It's it's also quite feasible to to try to um, knock down lipoxin production, which is what we think would be the is the reason for the the low inflammatory state, at yeah. least for for this particular uh, genetic variation. I'm sure there are many others, uh, and uh, and and those would should be in principle druggable because their receptors are GPCRs and and one would imagine that one can find drugs for them and I bet they're there in some, I bet they already exist. Um, and so does this new pathway, um, this led into this new pathway downstream of TNF, does it have any implications for vaccine design? Well, in as much as um, you, in as much as you, fee you think that modulating the, uh, the, innate, immune, the innate immune state contributes to uh, the success of a vaccine, which I think more and more people feel it does. So I think in that sense, yes, uh, you would imagine that modulating it to bring it to what is optimal for vaccination uh, would help. But I think the problem of a vaccine is goes far beyond that yeah. to the question of how to, how to vaccinate for, cell, for infections where cell-mediated immunity is the main problem. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.